Today we will learn and reflect on the life of St. Maximus the Confessor and his commentary on the Lord's Prayer and other writings in the Philokalia and other collections of his works. Why is St. Maximus known as the Confessor? What seven mysteries hidden in the Lord's Prayer does St. Maximus reveal to us? Why did the Byzantine Emperor Constance II cut off St. Maximus's tongue and right arm before exiling him on the shores of the Black Sea? What does the Lord's Prayer reveal about the twofold love of God and neighbor, the nature of the Trinity, and our deification through the grace of Christ? And when is the kingdom of God coming? Why should we be eager to forgive our neighbor? Should we forgive our neighbor when he refuses to apologize? Will God ever lead us into temptation? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we use for this video, and feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. The most important question is, how can we be saved? Jesus and Deuteronomy exhorts us, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. St. Maximus's commentary on this commandment teaches us that if we truly love God, this love is a great blessing that binds God and man together. And as much as is possible for man, Christ incarnate, the perfect deified man, will manifest himself in the deified man to raise him up as an adopted son to the Father. And in his words, love is a great blessing, and of all blessings, the first and supreme since it joins God and men together around him who has love, and it makes the creator of men manifest himself as man through the exact likeness of the deified man to God, in so far as this is possible for man. St. Maximus teaches us, love makes man God and reveals and manifests God as man through the single and identical purpose and activity of the will of both. And our saint links love of God to love of neighbor. Love of God is opposed to desire, for it persuades the intellect to control itself with regard to sensual pleasures. Love for our neighbor is opposed to anger, for it makes us scorn fame and riches. And Pelican starts his volume on Eastern Christendom with St. Maximus, the universal spirit of 7th century orthodoxy, who preserved the orthodoxy of past church fathers while laying a solid foundation for future generations. One chief idea of St. Maximus in orthodoxy is deification. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray for our deification. At the wedding at Cana, Jesus' first miracle, when the host said the good wine was saved until now, St. Maximus teaches us that this refers to Christ incarnate. We cannot attain deification on our own. We can only achieve deification as a gift from God, through our adoption by the Father through His Son, through divine grace, but with our cooperation. For free will must seek deification to receive it. We must, in faith, and in search of understanding, seek to clarify the meaning of the words we use, as St. Maximus teaches us. To say something without first distinguishing the meanings of what is said is nothing less than to confuse everything. St. Maximus was born to an upper-class family near Constantinople around 580. He had a classical education in philosophy, and his writings as a contemplative monk brought him to the attention of the royal court. He served as a monk, then became the abbot of a monastery across the Bosporus Straits, but was forced to flee to Carthage in North Africa when the Persians conquered Anatolia. During his lifetime, the Monophysite southern Mediterranean portion of the empire, including Egypt and modern-day Libya, came under siege and would fall to Islam. St. Maximus would move to Rome, where he became a theological advisor to Pope Martin I, and is today a saint equally celebrated by both the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches. And most of the second volume of the Orthodox Philokalia includes his writings. St. Maximus fought against the doctrine of monothelitism, the belief that Christ had but one will rather than two wills. This was similar to the debate of the two natures of Christ, the divine nature and the human nature, decided at the Council of Chalcedon. To St. Maximus, this was not an obscure theological dispute. We need to accept fully the humanity of Christ before we can be saved. But the emperor thought otherwise wishing to find a theological formulation acceptable to all so his empire would be united. St. Maximus and Pope Martin I were both arrested in Rome by imperial troops and were tried in Constantinople. When St. Maximus refused to recant, his tongue and right hand were cut off so he could no longer preach. He died in exile on the Black Sea in 662. 
Now, Confessor is someone who is not a martyr, but was someone who died from wounds incurred while defending the faith. Pope Martin I also refused to recant, but he kept his tongue in his right arm in his Black Sea exile. The doctrine of the two wells is briefly described in the commentary of St. Maximus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ prays to his father to ask that his cup be passed from him, but let not what I will, but what thou will be done. Christ in his human nature fears a painful death, as we would fear a painful death, and calls upon his father in his human nature. Then Christ demonstrates that his human will concurs with his divine will, which is in both Christ and the Father, by saying he will fulfill the divine will. The human will of Christ, though human, is not like our human will, as it was in its deified state immediately at the Assumption. Now, in his theological writings in the Philokalia, St. Maximus discusses the Trinity and divinity, and quickly transitions into how our thoughts should be on Christ, how we should worship Christ, and how we should talk and act to our neighbor. St. Maximus teaches us that salvation and deification are gifts given by grace by God who loves us. And in his words, a soul can never attain the knowledge of God unless God himself in his goodness takes hold of it and raises it up to himself. St. Maximus teaches us that the Lord's Prayer includes petitions for everything that the divine Logos affected through his self-emptying in the Incarnation. And it teaches us to strive for those blessings from the true provider, God the Father, through the natural mediation of the Son in the Holy Spirit. For the Lord Jesus is the mediator between God and men since he makes the unknown Father manifest to men through the flesh and gives those who have been reconciled to Christ access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And the Orthodox and Roman Catholic traditions differ in the depiction of the Trinity. Orthodox icons never depict God the Father. We only hear God the Father from the clouds. The early Church Fathers teach us that Jesus in his pre-incarnate form spoke to Adam and Eve and the patriarchs and often appeared as an angel. The visitation of the three angels to Abraham and Sarah is seen as a representation of the Trinity, and the angel with the halo is the pre-incarnate Christ. However, during the Renaissance, the warrior Pope Julius II, and he picked the name of Caesar rather than a saint, commissioned Michelangelo to paint on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel the depiction of God the Father creating man, rather than the pre-incarnate Jesus. Now, after the genius of Michelangelo, there was no going back. Similarly, I like to picture the theology of St. Maximus regarding the Incarnation and the Trinity like a couple who drove to a dinner party, but they take a wrong turn and don't pay attention. They drive into a canal and they lose their car, their keys, and their money, and they stumble into the theater with their muddy clothes. The usher kindly and lovingly admits them without a ticket, without asking for money, finds them new clothes, and ushers them into a massive room where they discover that not only are there no seats in the theater, there's no one play, there's no stage either but there are thousands of plays intertwined together. They ask when the play begins. The usher tells them that the play began when they arrived, and it never really ends. They expect to be spiritually fed, but that's incomprehensible here. Nor can they merely watch a play. They are in the play with everyone else. They are there to ascend to the stage by loving God and loving their neighbor, bringing out the best in them, bringing out the best in themselves, becoming divine, with the usher at the side of every actor, ever present, ever consoling, ever comforting, and ever assisting. And we transition from a crowded theater to the divine liturgy because we so often expect to be entertained by the singing at Sunday services. And the complaint that you're not spiritually fed by a church service implies that you are a passive participant, whereas you would benefit the most from Sunday services if you're an active participant listening to the scriptures and praying the prayers to the Lord. So if you do not benefit from the divine services, it is at least partially your fault. Now, to put this in a more scholarly manner, and St. Maximus is a cosmic theologian, where the cosmos of the divine descending from above in the carnation mirrored in the microcosmos of the individual ascending to heaven through deification. The incarnation of Christ in the hypostatic union of divine and human natures, eternally begotten, is safeguarding the purpose of the incarnation, the deification of man. If man chooses, he can through deification be united in God through grace. And the Logos is the supreme divine mediator, while humanity, the microcosm of the created order, can participate in Christ's mediation. Now, according to theologian Lars Thunberg, for St. Maximus, the theology, the Trinitarian mystery, and the oikonomia, the incarnation of the Logos, both differ as they are the same. They differ as the Logos is of the Trinity, and they are the same as when we imitate Christ, we also imitate the Father, whom we know through Christ, who offers his only Son as a sacrifice to us, and we also imitate the Trinity as a whole. The Incarnation, the Logos assuming flesh to dwell among us, through whom we are saved, by whom we are adopted by the Father, was in the divine plan. 
St. Maximus speculates that perhaps the Incarnation was planned without regards to the possibility of the Fall. Jesus' taking flesh transcends mere works. The Incarnation means God is personally involved in his creation and always intended to suffer and die so our soul can ascend so we can truly be like God. And reviewing some excerpts from St. Maximus' Centuries of Theology. Many Church Fathers view obedience as a virtue. St. John Climacus teaches us that obedience is one of the first virtues you master in your spiritual climb. Obedience masters your will and makes you open to spiritual instruction, increasing humility and virtue. Likewise, St. Maximus teaches us that just as the result of disobedience is sin, so the result of obedience is virtue. Just as disobedience leads to breaking the commandments and a separation from God who gave them, so obedience leads to keeping the commandments and to union with our God who gave them. Disobedience separates us from God, while obedience reunites us with God. St. Maximus teaches us that conquering the passions will never lead to the spiritual happiness unless you keep the commandments. Those who have a spiritual knowledge also have a rich store of virtues saved by practicing the virtues. The subjugation of the passions is not sufficient to ensure spiritual happiness for the soul, unless the soul also acquires the virtues by keeping the commandments. Whoever possesses spiritual knowledge must always possess a rich store of virtue as well, gained through his conduct. St. Maximus teaches us, according to the Gospel, the person who is simply a man of the faith can remove the mountain of his sin through the practice of the virtues. If he has a capacity to be a disciple, he receives fragments of the loaves of spiritual knowledge from the hands of the Logos and feeds thousands of people, demonstrating by his action how the power of the Logos is increased and multiplied by the practice of the virtues. The Logos is the Christ who miraculously fed 5,000 from a single fish and a loaf of bread. St. Maximus makes it clear that true knowledge of God is not a passive knowledge. You can never understand what loving God means unless you truly try to live a virtuous life. St. Maximus teaches us that those who put on a show of holiness for the sake of self-display not only fail to achieve anything through their false piety, but are also wounded by their conscience. But when a man's intellect is constantly with God, his desire grows beyond all measures into an intense longing for God, and his insensiveness and anger is completely transformed into divine love. St. Maximus teaches us that if we expand the teaching of the Logos from the standpoint of the moral light, using simple and plain words, all can understand, you make the Logos flesh. But conversely, if you elucidate mystical theology by means of higher forms of contemplation, you make the Logos spirit. Now, St. Maximus's commentary on the Lord's Prayer is an ideal window through which we can view his theology of Christ's incarnation and the economy of our salvation. We seek deification in the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer which starts out, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we're exhorted to love God and understand how we stand in his kingdom. And it continues as we pray how we should live our lives. Once we understand how we must repent of all our transgressions, no exceptions, and forgive everyone, no exceptions, so God will forgive us, and not withhold forgiveness from anyone, lest God withholds his forgiveness of us. As Matthew exhorts us after the end of the Lord's Prayer, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And this prepares us for the teachings of St. Maximus on the danger of selfishness and self-love, the root of all evil. Self-love can delude us to desperately seek the lust that leads to often mere moments of pleasure, but that can cause years of suffering for us and those around us. This self-love and lust for pleasure to avoid life's pain instead tyrannizes the lives of those close to us. To St. Maximus, through the Lord's Prayer, we seek deification of our nature and the spiritual bread which we need to live a godly life. We pray for the blessings of the Father through the mediation of Christ or Logos, who bestows adoption by the Father by grace from above through the Holy Spirit. As the Logos makes men equal to the angels, we should strive after the Logos through the practice of the virtues, through godly living and imitation of Christ. And what are the seven mysteries St. Maximus teaches us are hidden within the Lord's Prayer? Those seven are theology, adoption as sons by grace, equality with the angels, participation in eternal life, restoration of human nature when it is reconciled dispassionately with itself, abolition of the law of sin, and the destruction of the tyranny that holds us in its power through the deceit of the evil one. As St. Maximus teaches us, the Lord's Prayer includes petitions for everything that the Divine Logos, or Christ, affected through his self-emptying in the Incarnation, and it teaches us to strive from blessings of God the Father alone, 
through the natural mediation of the Son in the Holy Spirit. For the Lord Jesus is mediator between God and men, since he makes the unknown Father manifest to men through the flesh and gives those who have been reconciled to him access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. We live theology when we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. St. Maximus teaches that these words reveal to us Father, the name of the Father, and the kingdom of our Father, so that from this beginning we may be taught to revere, invoke, and worship the Trinity in unity. To the Trinity we owe our creation in our existence and our adoption as sons of God. As St. Maximus teaches us, we are taught to proclaim the grace of our adoption since we have been found worthy of addressing our Creator by nature as our Father by grace. Thus, the love of Christ leads us to seek to live a godly life. Venerating this title of our begetter by grace, we strive to stamp our Creator's qualities on our lives, sanctifying His name on earth, taking after Him as our Father, showing ourselves to be His children through our actions and through all that we think or do, glorifying the author of this adoption, who is by nature Son of the Father. Desire and corrupting passions breed anger, but anger stops when desire has been put to death. When we pray, Thy kingdom come, we pray, may the Holy Spirit come, making us a temple for God by the teaching and practice of gentleness. Here, meekness is translated as gentleness in the Beatitude. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. St. Maximus speculates that here, the earth signifies the resolution and strength of the inner stability, immovable, rooted in goodness, that is possessed by gentle people. This stability contains unfailing joy, enables the gentle to attain the kingdom, and permits the gentle to inherit the principle of virtue, as if virtue were the earth that occupies a middle place in the universe. St. Maximus asks, What man will be so lacking in love and completely without appetite for divine blessings that he will not desire the greatest degree of humility and gentleness so he can take on the stamp of the kingdom, so far as this is possible for man, and to bear in himself by grace an exact spiritual likeness of Christ, who by nature is the truly great king? When Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, he answers, The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. St. Maximus reflects on this, teaching us that there are souls that through the grace of God resemble God. In these souls Christ always desires to be born in a mystical way, becoming incarnate in those who attain salvation, and making the soul that gives birth to him a virgin mother. St. Maximus continues, This kingdom is characterized by the humility and gentleness of heart. And the humble does not regard what is painful in the senses as a privation of pleasure. He only knows one pleasure, the marriage of the soul within the Logos, seeking deification through the grace of Christ. And what is meant by thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? St. Maximus teaches us that when we worship God mystically, with our intelligence alone, keeping it free from sensual desire and anger, we fulfill the divine will on earth just as the angels fulfill the divine will in heaven. Who will be saved? Who will inherit the kingdom? Those who are humble and gentle, for all who are humble are invariably gentle, and all who are gentle are invariably humble. What do we pray when we pray, give us this day our daily bread? St. Maximus teaches us, if we live in the way that we have promised, we will receive as daily and life-giving bread from the nourishment of our souls, the Logos himself. For it was he who said, I am the bread that came down from heaven and gives life to the world. St. Maximus believes that this day refers to the current age, the spiritual daily bread that grants us immortality. Adam, the first man, was prevented from partaking of this bread by his transgression of the divine commandment, not to eat the apple from the tree of knowledge. But we can partake of the bread of the Logos himself, who came down from heaven to give life to the world. If we pray that our physical needs are met, St. Maximus teaches us that we should pray for today's bread, that we should eat to live and not live to eat, eating enough to stay in good health and trust in God, and do not worry about where the bread for tomorrow will come. But let us know that we eat for the sake of living and not be guilty of living for the sake of eating. St. Maximus teaches us that it is not food that is evil, but gluttony, not the begetting of children, but unchastity, not material things, but avarice, not esteem, but self-esteem. This being so, it is only the misuse of things that is evil, and such misuse occurs when the intellect fails to cultivate its natural powers. St. Maximus teaches us that he who asks to receive his daily bread, the bread of life, receives it according to his spiritual capacity to receive this bread. Those who are righteous are giving this bread in greater measure, but all are given this bread out of God's love. After we have sought our daily spiritually bread, we should be eager to pray, forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. We should forgive others with joy and without hesitation, 
For St. Maximus teaches us that we should beg for God to treat us as we have treated our neighbors. Just as God dispassionately forgives us, so we should be dispassionate towards those who harm us, eagerly forgiving them without anger, without rancor, without hesitation. We must not allow the memory of our afflictions to be stamped on our intellects, lest they separate us from our neighbor. When we are unable to forgive our neighbor, we cannot receive God's gift of himself. Now the Four Centuries of Love by St. Maximus provides other useful teachings on repentance and forgiving. St. Maximus teaches us we are not capable of repenting of our sins if we do not forgive others their sins. St. Maximus teaches us he who busies himself with the sins of others or judges as his brother on suspicion has yet not even begun to repent or to examine himself to discover his own sins, which are truly heavier than a great lump of lead. And St. Maximus teaches us that we sin for various reasons. It is one reason to sin through force of habit, and another thing to sin impulsively. When you sin impulsively, you do not deliberately choose the sin before committing it, and are often deeply distressed by the sin. But when you sin by habit, you are already sinning in your thoughts, and afterwards you are in the same state of mind. Should we forgive our brother even when he does not apologize? St. Maximus and the other church fathers say little about apologies. Although St. Maximus says that we should apologize to make peace with our brother. Apologies should never be a prerequisite for forgiveness, for as St. Maximus teaches. If your brother does not want to live peaceably with you, nevertheless guard yourself against hatred, praying for him sincerely, and do not speak ill of him to anyone. St. Maximus teaches us that the sensible man gladly bears the sufferings of this world, as they are caused by our sins, and does not blame those who bring us trials and sufferings, but rather rejoices in his humility through suffering. In the words of St. Maximus, when a trial comes unexpectedly, do not blame the person who caused it, but try to discover the reason why it came. As long as you have bad habits, do not reject hardships so you can be humbled. Trials are sent to some so as to take away past sins, to others to eradicate current sins, yet to others to forestall future sins. But when the fool, ignorant of God's wisdom, sins and is corrected, he blames either God or men for the hardship he suffers. Next, we ask God to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now why should God lead us into temptation? Surely God does not, but we need God's grace to help us to resist temptation. St. Maximus teaches us, He who has not completely forgiven those who stumble, and has not brought his heart to God free from grievance, and illuminated with the light of reconciliation with his neighbor, will fail to attain the grace of the blessings he has prayed for. Instead, he will justly be handed over to temptation and to evil, so that, having retracted his judgments of other people, he may learn to purify himself of his own sins. St. Maximus teaches us we should be eager to forgive the sins of our neighbors. So in saying the Lord's Prayer, we should receive a double grace, forgiveness of sins already committed, and protection and deliverance from future sins, which is why I always describe the twofold love as love of God and love of neighbor, and the St. Maximus corollary as we should be eager to forgive our neighbor. What does St. Maximus teach us about the aims of prayer? When we pray, we should seek deification, we should remember the depths to which we were dragged by the weight of our sins. Now Christ emptied himself to take on flesh so he could raise us up to the heavens with his compassionate hand. In St. Maximus' words, when we pray, let our aim be this mystery of deification, which shows us what we were once like and what the self-emptying of the only begotten Son through the flesh has now made us, which shows us the depths to which we were dragged down by the weight of sin and the heights to which we have been raised by his compassionate hand so we can have greater love for him who has prepared the salvation for us with such wisdom. He who truly loves God prays without distraction, and he who prays entirely without distraction loves God truly. St. Maximus reminds us that the intellect joined to God for long periods through prayer and love becomes wise, good, powerful, and compassionate, merciful, and long-suffering. In short, it includes within itself almost all the divine qualities. But when the intellect withdraws from God and attaches itself to material things, either it becomes self-indulgent like some domestic animal, or like a wild beast it fights with men for the sake of these things. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. St. Maximus the Confessor is one of my favorite Eastern saints. As is often true with translations from the Greek, sometimes it's a bit wordy, and I did condense many quotations. We chose to concentrate on his essay in the Lord's Prayer because it is a good introduction to his thought. We scratch the surface of his other works in the Philokalia, and they take up most of volume two, plus his other works. And we discuss the sources more in depth in our introductory video on the Philokalia. We have another collection of his writings in On the Cosmic Mystery of Jesus Christ, 
and a collection of scholarly essays on the Philokalia. We had purchased a tome authored by Lars Thunberg on our saint, but it was as dense as bricks. We preferred his shorter book on our saint, Man in the Cosmos. Jaroslav Pelikan's History of Christian Doctrine is excellent, and we elaborate on the series in our book reviews of early church fathers. St. Maximus the Confessor was deeply influenced in his depictions on the nature of Christ and his descriptions of the Trinity by Dionysius the Areopagite, a Christian Neoplatonist theologian, and in particular his work on the divine names. We began our reflections on Dionysus with his mystical theology. We are planning a video on his divine names in late 2023. This will include reflections by Hans Urs Balthasar's books on St. Maximus, the Cosmic Liturgy, that explores the influence of Dionysus on the works of St. Maximus. Many of our icons of St. Maximus were from the Mystagogy website, and they have many interesting articles on St. Maximus. And the thumbnail is a photo of the monastery on Mount Athos in Greece. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.